Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Backyard Bounty. I'm your host, Nicole, and today I'm joined with Dave from Crown Bees, and we're going to talk about native pollinators and uh, the differences between natives and honeybees and how we can support our native pollinators the best. And Dave, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, this is going to be fun. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I've been a fan of Crown Bees for several years now, and I have several of your native bee um, hotels. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. You know, it's been so fun to watch the natives. I get so much enjoyment of watching them. So I was really excited to record an episode with you today and to learn more and to educate others about natives because they're obviously um, a huge part of our culture and our ecosystem, and, and they definitely are imperative. So so, yeah, I'm very excited. Good. Those are magical words. So many people think that when we hear bee, there's only one bee in the world, and that's the honeybee. And, I, and I'm going to say that's true in research. That's true in just the casual person walking down the street. I think the times are changing. Um, I think a long time ago, people used to say, oh, look out there. There's a bunch of animals. And then finally someone said, I think that's a cow. And then you know, later on, I think they started naming the things. You know, those were the big objects. I think they're getting down to bees. You know, oh, look. This is a bumblebee. There's a honeybee. This is a ground nester. I mean, there's just, I think more people are learning about smaller things and bees is, you know, is kind of the next on the block. So it, it is good to help people understand there are differences out there. Yeah, I feel like the honeybee is kind of the poster child for most mm -hmm. pollinators. When you say save the bee, everybody thinks of, of the honeybee. But mm -hmm. I think it's good, at least for awareness, but it's important to know that there is more than just the honeybee out there. Yeah, let me, um, if I could, just give you a little rundown of, you know, what's a native bee? So when we're saying they're honeybee, we get that. The hive, the honey, the queen, you know, you can move them around, et cetera. So there's the honeybee. Mm -hmm. What we're touching with the bees of the world, first of all, Nicole, I work with researchers around the nation, um, around the world, on the native bee side. Uh, my company kind of asks why to a lot of things that helps us figure out um, more of what we're doing. So that's kind of my background. So when we're talking about native bees, there's about 24,000 species of bees in the world. And there are seven, you know, seven honeybee species of those 24,000. So it isn't, you know, there's a, probably maybe more volume of the honeybees, but there's certainly far more species of other bees. That's part of it. When we look at those, even in the U.S., there's about 4,000 species of native bees. None of them make honey. There is no native honey-making bee. Okay, so Nicole, when did the honeybee show up? Uh, when we immigrated to the U.S. Very good. Shortly after. Shortly after. And because it needed some, we needed something sweet, the pilgrims right. or whoever they were. Okay, and there wasn't enough pollen so what did they bring with them? The dandelion. Oh. Oh, there we go. Because of the honeybee, we had the dandelions in our yard. Eh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just is. So now when you're looking at, let's say, the 4,000 species of, of native bees in North America, there's kind of two kingdoms of them. One of them are the social. Okay, so where everyone gets along together and there's a queen and there's drones and they're in a hive. And so that's bumblebee honeybee. And you could say like your wasp nest outside, that's a social thing. That's 10% mm -hmm. of the bees of the world. So just 400 of species. All the rest are solitary where every single female is a queen and they all typically live eh, about maybe six weeks. And they come out, they're going to mate and they have their eggs are going to lay somehow. And then they're dead after about six weeks. And the eggs they laid this year are next year's bees. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So solitary social, and then most of the bees nest in the ground. And we're going to call those ground nesters, about three quarters. And so those are a lot of bumblebees in the ground. There's digger bees and minor bees and alkali bees, you know, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of bees. And then about 25 nest in available holes. So a paper tube, uh, a broken reed, or holes in trees. Okay. That's it. Kind of, you know, social, solitary, ground nesters, and hole nesters. Fair? Mm -hmm. Fair. So they're all independent bees. They don't live in these big colonies like the right. honeybee. And what we're even, you know, to go in even a little further, so across the country, every state um, has 
different species of bees in there. So the bees of South California are vastly different than the bees of Northern California or clearly Maine or, or Florida. So every region has different types of bees. And so some bees work well in the you know, hot climates, some bees work uh, well in the early or late spring. So these bees they come out at just different times of the year and then you know, they have different characteristics which make them successful in Oklahoma. So there's, there's a lot of bees out there. And with these bees still being pollinators, I believe I read somewhere that they actually pollinate like the fruit trees better than the honeybees. Is that correct? Yeah. So when we're analyzing what happens with the pollen transfer, so, you know, why is the pollen even in the environment at all? Uh, your plants, it's kind of about sex, you know, plant sex. Yes. It is. Plant, plant sex. sex. There, <laughs> there you go. Someone needs to move. Uh, that pollen from point A to the ovule, point B, maybe it's in a different, uh, on the same plant, or there's a male plant and a female plant. Okay, so someone's moving it, right? That's And the bees are best. Butterflies are there, and moths are there, and ants and beetles spread pollen, but really bees are the best. Okay, the honeybee is so sophisticated. It's got, I think, what, 1,500 eggs are laid a day, maybe 1,000, 1,500, is that about right? Yeah, I've read different numbers, yeah. but that's uh, the uh, rough average. A lot, okay. And so yes. that's, you think about it, then that's thousand little mounds of pollen about the size of a pencil eraser a day are needed. And so the honeybee has evolved to get an awful lot of pollen back to the hive. And so sticky on the hind legs, the bees are very, very sophisticated and, and they've evolved. They you know, get the pollen in the flower and then it is wet with saliva and back on the hind legs. And a few years ago, I spoke with Dr. Um, Musson from UC Davis. He said, Dave, that's bee food. That's not pollen. Okay. The honeybees are great pollen takers. And, and in nice little words, scientists call them pollen pigs. That's <laughs> okay, because they're really good at gathering pollen. All right. So your natives, um, far less sophisticated. They don't need that much pollen in a day. And so they, you'll find the bees will like belly flop into a flower. And they're carrying, they're trying to crab, uh, cram the pollen in their hairy bodies. And it's belly flop in there, cram, cram the pollen, next flower, belly flop. And this dry pollen is falling off everywhere. And so these guys, the, the native bees are really unsophisticated bees, but they are pollen spreaders. As my company works with backyard gardeners to farmers, people, when they're starting to use these native bees, are finding there's more food in their yards. And so like science has said, gosh, since the 80s, when you put mason bees on cherry fields, you're getting triple the yield. A couple of years ago, um, Old Dominion came out with a study on, on strawberries. Gosh, when you put the mason bee on strawberries, 1.5 times the yield. Huh, okay. So they gather pollen differently. And for, I guess, different reasons, you know, everyone is grabbing the pollen so that they can put it into a, you know, a, a spot and they're going to lay an egg and that egg is going to use that pollen to become a larva and develop into a bee. There's your whole pollen reason. Okay. So I see sometimes on some of the gardening groups that I'm in that people will post that they are interested in becoming a beekeeper because they're interested in having a higher yield in their mm -hmm. garden and, and better pollination mm -hmm. and whatnot but they don't really care about the honey or they're concerned about getting stung. So this could maybe be an option for people like that. Oh, get out. You know, yes. And, and actually that little, that point right there, Nicole, in a social bee, everything is kind of protect the queen, protect the eggs, protect the honey. Okay. So get close to a hive. And I think if you kicked your hive, you're going to get stung, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> right. No. Okay, so with the with the less sophisticated bees, every, since on the when they're solitary, the queen that is laying eggs in a, she's chosen her own little paper tube or reed. It's hers. She's gathering the pollen and nectar, lays an egg, and then kind of seals that chamber. And so she's doing all of this in the yard. She can't sit there and defend the hole and also do all those other things. So they just don't defend the hole, and as a result, the venom in these native solitary bees 
is typically super low, more of a mosquito bite than, you know, you can get stung. These are bees with a stinger. The only way really to get stung is I've grabbed one in my hand and squished it. And it lets me know, ah, you know, don't squish me. But it's really hard to find where the bee stung you and it doesn't itch or anything. Just a kind of little different flavor. Yes, as a result, these bees are easier for people to raise because there's um, probably no fear of being stung. And um, also there's super, super lower maintenance. How much does it take? How many hours a, a month would you say you put into your hives? Well, I use a little bit different technique than okay. some mm -hmm. where I just kind of let them do their thing. Okay. Um, I don't like to bother them because they don't really like it. So I pretty much um, only check them a couple times a year. And most of the time I just just observe from afar. I bet that works well. How Are they more healthier, do you think? or? I think so. I mean, it, it, after you open up the hive, it usually takes them a couple of weeks to recover. Hmm. Um, so I found that the less I mess with them, the happier they are. Well, I don't know if they're happy. I don't get a chance to ask them. But, <laughs> but no they, dialogue there. <laughs> right. But they um, certainly they don't have the stress of me digging around in their hive and, and they seem to produce better and to be um, more calm when I'm out in the yard. So those that are more than, let's say that's going to be on the soft side of things, the average honeybee person is in there checking, putting folic acid, looking for crud, I guess. So again, there's different thought processes. Some people use different techniques, but I would say during the swarm season, which is in our area from about May, June-ish until August-ish, mm -hmm. some people recommend that you check your hive every two weeks for swarm cells. And then otherwise, it's most people probably check them once every month to six weeks. Okay. So on the native bee side, when we're talking about mason bees or leafcutter bees, it's about maybe a total of a half an hour, maybe a year to kind of manage these things. You know, you've got bees in the spring that you're going to go put out. So you've walked outside with your mason bee house and you place it on a wall. So maybe there's 10 minutes and then uh, you have cocoons in your hands. And these are, you know, live bees in cocoons that they're, you know, you can't even see them, looks like little raisins. So there's five minutes to go put your cocoons out. And then really all summer long, you're just kind of, or, you know, when they're active, they're, they're active for six weeks. So you're watching them nest. And then really um, in the fall, we're asking that people learn to manage a little bit. There's pests in there and we're going to throw 15 to 20 minutes at you in the fall just to, we call it harvesting, where you're opening these holes and you're looking for pests and cocoons and you're just kind of holding cocoons in your hand at the end. So there's probably half an hour, I mean, lower, low key, but we are managing. So slightly less time involvement. <laughs> yeah. And yes. And much, much more gentler, but um, sounds like a lot what I just said there, uh, but we teach. My company has a thing called bee mail. Once a month, we just say, hey, do this. It's May. This is exactly what you should do. It's the fall. Here's specifically how you harvest and here's some videos. And so we help people think through the learning curve so that it's, um, yeah, we want people successful. So with crown bees specifically, you mentioned the leaf cutters and mm -hmm. the masons. Is that pretty much the two that you mostly involved yourself with? Yes. we. It's a great question. We focus, um, my company, uh, Crown Bees, is a, I call it a food company masquerading as a bee company. So when you use these bees, you get more food. That's kind of our premise. Mm -hmm. um, I can't take, so the, you know, if most of the bees nest in the ground, I can't take a shovel full of, of dirt and just hope that I've got bees in there without killing them. You know, so moving them from my yard to your farm. I can though, take a handful of reeds or paper tubes from my yard and then hand them to your farm. And now there are bees in your yard. So I may, we focus on that type of a bee that we can move. So when I said mason bee or leafcutter bee, the mason bee, I just said dog. Oh my gosh, there's hundreds of species of dogs and there's hundreds of species of mason bees. And leafcutter bees, a little different, kind of they both use a hole, but there's multiple types of leafcutter bees and they're just Depends on where you are in the country. There's different types of these bees. So if I wanted to get native bees, can I get both of them or mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. can I only get one or the other? Okay, good question. Uh, as, we, as we see that the bees are active at different times of the year, there are some bees, the, um, the blue orchard, it's one of the mason bees that we sell. 
comes out, boy, right in the beginning of spring when the dandelions show up. And about six weeks later, it's gone. Okay, There are other bees then that can show up in late May. The leafcutter bees are showing up maybe more in June through August. And so there are different species that are there at different times. So if you wanted bees in your yard, and we sell bees. So if you're looking for spring things, I can send you bees in February through April. So I kind of said almonds and cherries all the way into blueberry season. And then after they're kind of nesting, boy, the bees are going from April all the way into late May, early June. So that might be even to raspberries. And so people are able to say, ah, gosh, I really care about my raspberries. So I'm going to send them bees that will emerge in late April that can then work into the raspberries. And so then we also have like leaf cutter bees. Eh, you just tell us when and we'll send you bees from you know May all the way into, gosh, early September. Whether you're doing pumpkins or you're pollinating flowers or beans or something. I mean, so we you know have the bees flying at different times of the year. So that's kind of the main difference between the leaf cutter and the mason is just the time of year that they're out? I think that's fair. And and even if a scientist were out there um, vetting this conversation, <laughs> Dave, I think there's some spring leaf cutter bees out there as well. It's like, yeah, we don't have them, but yes, there are. So, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So I simplified it to the bees that <laughs> I have, but sure. you know, in honesty, I think there's a variety. Oh my gosh. There's tiny, Nicole, if you ever, I'm sure you've done this. You go out to your yard and you've got some bush that is just full of flowers. And to sit there for 15 minutes and just see if you can count the species. Here's a bumblebee with a yellow stripe or a bumblebee with an orange stripe. Or here's just Bitsy. What is that thing? And it's just microscopic bee. And then honeybees. And it's just, it's really fun. And so to learn that um, you can raise some of these yourself, you know, it's kind of fun. It's a good, it's a, it's a good hobby. And you know, people then are trying to get food as well. Yeah, this year I planted some of the Lemon Queen sunflowers and I had heard they were really good for pollinators and, and I hadn't planted them before. And it was so fun. I would just go out there and I always took my phone and uh-huh. I swear every time I went out there, there was a different species of native bee. And I, I don't know even what a lot of them were, but it was so fun to watch them. Oh, it's okay. So that last little comment, I've worked with some of the major um, taxonomists, one who identifies bees out there. And I've sent pictures of of this. Dave, it's a bee. (laughs) (laughs) There's 4,000 species. I know, you know, 10 of them by heart, but you know, it's like, oh, okay. So it's never, it's, there's so many bees. It's not that easy to define them yet. Yeah. So when you're talking about a native bee house, Mm -hmm. what does that look like? Actually, uh, it's, it's not that It's not that hard to picture. The bees are nesting in holes. Picture a straw and about maybe a pencil size diameter is the big size and go all the way down to maybe like an eighth of an inch. There are tiny little bees that use four millimeter holes and bees that'll use an eight millimeter hole. Okay, so there's a big guys uh, size difference. These holes are about maybe six inches long, five, six, seven inches long, and the bees are just going to nest in there. Natively, they're going into um, broken reeds in their yard. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. These holes are kind of put together in a little pile. I'm putting my hands together into about a circle and put into a house that keeps the holes dry. So really, house and holes are really all the bees are looking for. I think there's some products out there nowadays that have pine cones and they're trying to think through butterfly little thingies. And mostly those don't work. Um, the pine cones, I don't want earwigs next to my bees, so I'm not going to put pine cones there. And... <laughs> And there's these cute little contraptions. We have like a, it's like a slit. There's a hole behind there. It's like a slit. Have you seen those at all for butterflies mm-hmm. to use? Um, oh, I guess I probably have. Yeah. Yeah. And it, from talking with the butterfly experts, they say, gosh, Dave, those are just holes for um, wasps to go build their nests in. Oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, but if butterflies don't use those, it's like, oh, well, okay. So your Macy Bee House is really our varied holes, varied size holes in a house. And you're really, you're putting this house um, in your yard someplace, kind of facing morning sun. So about head height. If I were short, I might put it at four or so feet. If I was tall, I might have put it at six feet. Just so I could stand back and watch them. They're just so entertaining. So really, whole house and and place uh, where there's pollen and maybe not a lot of wind, but um, good morning sun. So these are... The native bee houses are are like the um, 
I've seen them at like at the garden store. They're kind of the birdhouse looking thing, but there's the... With the front missing. Yeah, the holes mm-hmm. and then blocks with holes in them too. Yeah. One of the things we're trying to um, help educate people on, um, there's a lot of bad designs. People are out there making money. They just are. And so drilled blocks of wood, bamboo. The bees will use these things, bamboo reeds and, and drilled blocks of holes. But what we're also finding, when you put so many holes in one area, so I got a handful of, of holes, there are pests that move in there as well. Okay, nature normally has these holes far apart in trees, and so pests can't get to all the holes at the same time. Boy, when you aggregate them, it is, you know, there's beetles are in there and pollen mites and all, you know, crud. Okay, so that's natural. But if you don't do anything about it quickly, uh, the following year, the bees have emerged. They've, you know, they've lived in the holes. These eggs were laid. They became larvae. The larvae spun cocoons. They overwintered as bees. And as they emerge, you know, to go do these things again, but they've got pests with them in those same holes. So out they go, all the bees, all have emerged, and the pests are just sitting there in the holes waiting. Some brand new female comes in and chooses that hole with the pests in there and begins laying, you know, here's the pollen, here's the egg. And she's just feeding the pests. So when you use these um, cheap uh, bamboo holes that can't be opened, you're really just kind of dooming the future bees to, you know, you're just feeding pests. So not all houses are the same, but yes, you do find them at nurseries. And I'm saying when your listeners are out there getting these things, make sure the holes can be opened up kind of that and make sure they're about maybe pencil size and smaller you'll find there's a lot of different stuff out there and and they don't know what they're doing and when you say that the holes can be opened i'm not sure what you mean by that ah, um take a take a reed and i'm gonna just crimp the end and pull it apart and now i've actually got um, two halves of a reed and down this open half i find cocoons and pests Okay. In a paper tube, I'm able to unwind them. Think of like the pop and fresh croissants years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you can unwind these paper tubes. And now you have cocoons and, and, and we have wood trays that when I open these trays have like a bunch of half holes in them. I put two trays together and now they make complete holes. So when I open them up, now I've got eight half holes on one side, eight half holes on the other side. So I, I have exposed the cocoons to the air. And so okay. if I can't do that and separate the bad guys from the good guys, then, eh, you know, it, it, is, um, it is nature. And when you've aggregated all the bees in one little place, yeah, we just kind of doomed the future bees to, you know, we didn't, we didn't know any better. And that's okay. I mean, you know, just, it just is. Sure. So if I get a little bee house and mm-hmm. I get bee cocoons, how do I ensure that the bees that hatch from the cocoon are going to hang around and use my bee house? Um, that's a very valid question. When we mail you bees or cocoons, the bees are looking for three things, typically. They're looking for holes of the right size. They're looking for pollen in the yard. And then the third little piece each bee needs is something that helps her secure her holes. So in this hole, she goes back there and she gathers pollen, about 30 trips worth of pollen and nectar gathering, makes this little eraser-sized mound of pollen. She backs in and lays an egg, looks like a little grain of rice, and then she seals that chamber to protect that egg. And some, some mason bees use mud, we saw those. Other bees use tree resin or chewed up leaf bits or the fuzz from flowers. I mean, there's just a variety of things that bees in different parts of the country. If you're in the desert, bees are using cactus pulp, pollen, egg, cactus pulp. <laughs> that's, <laughs> How, that's what they're doing in there. <laughs> well, well, that's good. How do we make sure that they keep doing that and that they don't take off? Ah, they're looking for those three things. We have an attractant that um, you can spray. We call it Invita Bee. And there's a pheromone that smells like bees have nested there beforehand, and that, that kind of helps. But in general, we're laying the cocoons that you've bought, you know, behind the holes. The bees, as they emerge at their own little time, it's warm enough for them. They're going to chew out of their cocoon, walk down on top of the holes. And then um, some of them just, boof, off they go to, you know, find a new place. Most of them do like a figure eight. Where did I come from? They fly around and then they're going to mate and they just kind of typically hang there. And so most people that when they're trying to get the bees that we saw, 
most of the people are successful. You know, a couple of bees nested the following year, a lot more bees nest. And then um, ultimately, gosh, we have people across the country. They are so successful. They have so many mason bees. They mail their extra bee cocoons to us uh, in the fall. And so we call this the bee buyback. And we're uh, around the country. People are sending us hundreds of thousands of bees. Like I'll get bees from Pennsylvania. They come back to us here in, in Washington state. We clean them up, put them in a little Pennsylvania bin. And then as people in Pennsylvania want bees, we're sending those bees back to them. So we're trying to be as ethical as we can to keep the bees disease spread down and the bees are acclimated to those areas. So we think about it. And in general, um, they do well. Is there anywhere that people wouldn't be able to use these bees? We, yes. The blue orchard bee, it's a very common clay, you know, mud using bee. It's found in every province, every state, but right along the Gulf of uh, Mexico. So Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi. No, those bees don't go well there. The leafcutter bees do. We do have uh, people looking for bees for us in these states. And there are, there are Florida bees that nest in holes. And we've got people just putting holes out for us to see which bee comes in and uses them. And then ultimately, we'll have a lot of Florida bees understood and you know used in Florida farms and backyards. So do you have any other tips for success if somebody wanted to start raising native bees in their yard this spring? Yes. I'm always thinking things through from the bees' perspective, not my perspective. Okay, so we've talked about having nice little holes and place them on a, you know, on a morning, east, typically eastern, southeastern wall. That's easy. Uh, the bees are looking for pollen, and typically your natives, at least the solitary ones, don't travel that far maybe a 300 foot radius, 100 meter radius, says eh, six acres, you know, two or so hectares. So the pollen in that large area is really all you need. I wouldn't really plant too many plants. So pollen, holes, and then I'd be very careful with um, chemicals. We've learned that lawn treatment has a lot of toxic crud in it that has your bees typically fly away. And, and a frustration is your neighbor or two neighbors away, that downwind plume of toxic smells have your bees flying someplace else. And so, you know, as frustrating as it is, when people get bees, we a lot of times will say, ask your neighbors to just not treat their lawns, you know, stop spraying just for a little bit. So really a clean, healthy yard, pollen and holes. About it. <laughs> and tell your neighbors. So I live in a, a pretty suburban area. So naturally, when I think of anything, that's what I think of. But would the native bees, would there be enough pollen for them to survive in an urban environment? Yeah. So I think an urban environment, it has more pollen load. I mean, give or take, has more pollen load. There's more people love flowers, people that are growing things. Dandelions are left. A six acre radius is really big. And I think most people, give or take just an asphalt jungle, I think there's most people are successful that the bees are able to find what they need. I think when you throw the stress of a honeybee in an urban environment, I think it becomes a little harder for native bees to find their pollen. And it depends upon the neighborhood. If you've got a flower rich area, then I think um, no big deals. But it's maybe you're more um, sparse like a, a San Diego type environment would um, maybe not be helpful to have both bees present. We've kind of established that we can use, you know, native bees in pretty much any environment, you know, urban and otherwise. But what about, you know, I see a bunch of things, you know, the commercial beekeepers will send their hives to the almond fields to pollinate those. Is there any way that people can utilize the natives to use in that kind of agricultural setting? It, that's a st st sticky, I'm going to give you a sticky answer. Uh oh. Um, yeah. We find, and I'm, I'm going to step on a lot of toes out here in your listeners, we find that farmers tend to change at the speed of a glacier. Okay. <laughs> it, and I, I think a farmer is, um, she is so busy with so many variables, the price of crop and people are going to picking and how can I sell it and, you know, pests, et cetera. They don't have time to introduce a new variable. So it's this, the science has been there. Uh, when you put mason bees on cherries, you're getting triple the yield. All right. That's what they're in the eighties, but a, a P 
peer of mine a couple of seasons ago spoke to 600 uh, cherry farmers out in, out in eastern Washington. She said, gosh, you guys, out of this audience here, how many people, raise your hands, how many people have heard about mason bees? And about 15 hands rose out of 600. Okay, so maybe 30 people, just, you know, 15 people didn't raise their hands. But you look at that, science showed that when you're putting mason bees on strawberries, you're getting, you know, one and a half times the yield and the, and the strawberries come soon. Okay, but no, almost no strawberry farmers use mason bees. And so I reached out to the president of the North American Strawberry Association out in Canada. Hey, here was a study. Did you guys see it? Yeah. Did you let your farmers know about this? Yeah, we put the little link in our, in our newsletter. I said, so how come no one, and I'm the biggest company out there, how come no one is reaching out and putting, you know, bees on strawberries? And the guy says, well, you know, strawberries don't need pollinators. I said, well, but science shows they're getting one half a times. He goes, ah, that's just science. <laughs> huh. Okay, but then, you know, you know, whoever this person was, he's an administrator. He's not necessarily a farmer. But that just says, you know, when you got both those situations, we find that it's hard to change. We're asking researchers to work with us to learn, you know, how do we increase the yield of kiwis and onion seeds. So we're, we, we want all this research done because we think we can actually get more food. But that's only half the, the issue. The other half is how do you get the farmer or the grower to actually consider using something other than a honeybee? Even if you get more yield and even if it's in science, why would they change? Ah. I think at this time, the people that would listen are the millennials because they're coming into something new and they're willing to learn. And I also think the, uh, the older people that have left their big girl or big boy job are now going to be a farmer. I think they would ask questions. Would you say that compared to the honeybee and bringing in, for example, the hives during mm -hmm. almond season, would you say that the native bees are financially and logistically feasible in comparison? In, that's an interesting question. Um, you're so full of them. <laughs> These <cool. laughs> are great questions. Thank you. In this infancy of the mason bee environment, the bees are kind of expensive. And it's um, in the almond industry, you'll get it probably 25% more yield. And the bees are probably a less than the cost of a honeybee hive because the almonds need so many hives. But bounce out into the cherries and into the peaches and stuff, I think the price of mason bees is higher today when you're just buying the bee and that's all the farmer's thinking about. If the farmer's looking at the net yield, the price of the bee is insignificant. I have gardeners complaining about too much plums on their trees. And they're propping the branches up with boards. You know, it's just, you, you get so much more yield with a pollen spreading bee. But up front, the cost is kind of, um, you know, it's like, eh, it's, it's a little bit of money. Well, I assume that there's more sustainability though whereas mm -hmm. if you rent a honey beehive you have to rent it every year but if you set up homes for the natives and maybe you purchase the cocoons from you guys for a couple of years but after a while you would build the population and then they would be somewhat self-sufficient that's our want that's exactly our want um, sometimes in the farming environment uh, the conventional farmers um, are spraying a lot. And mm. so the, we sold you a thousand cocoons for your acre and maybe you only got 400 or 500 cocoons back. Maybe on a good year might've gotten maybe 800 back, but it's the chemical environment tends to uh, weigh heavily on natives. And so I think as uh, we humanity uh, migrate away from the toxic crud we're putting out there, I think we'll see better returns. Sure. But today, our environments, even organic, it sounds like you're putting, you're still spraying, you're putting organic crud out there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so I think, yes, the backyard gardener, a lot differently. Typically, um, most gardeners wind up getting more and more every year. Well, yeah, I think that that's certainly something to consider for a food producer at, at any level. It's frustrating. We have seen research show that around the world, when you have um, wild bees, and the, I was in the audience when the researcher said this, he goes, and, and not the honeybee. When you find wild bees in a, in a farm, 25% more yield. Okay, you know, but that, that statement is just a, it is a statement to the wind. And I think it's going to change. You know, I think an and scenario where you have both honeybee and wild bees would be um, a biodiverse environment and, and preferable. You know, honeybee is kind of easy. Native bees, eh, not always so. So let's do both. Sure. So you've mentioned that you guys work with 
researchers and, and different things. What other projects do you guys have going on? Um, we've got multiple channels. We, we, uh, so my company is a very innovative, small company out here in, in the Seattle area. Product development, we're, we have things online, crownbees.com. You can buy that there. We have things in nurseries. There you go. We're starting to talk with farmers. And so we have products in, in you know, bees and things in some farms. Our biggest program, and it's a big one. It's a scary one. Um, we think out of the 4,000 species of bees in North America, let's say 1,000 nests and holes, they're out there, but they're dwindling. A lot of what we're doing is, is helping them go away. And my company is trying to uh, reverse this. And so we've got this thing called, it's a program called the Native Bee Network. You'll see it on our website under programs. And we're asking, gosh, 4-H kids and conservation districts, master gardener networks, for people to put out holes, small, medium, and large, we've got them, you know, register your site on our, on our, you know, we have a big database out there, just register on our, your smartphone. And then um, we'll give you some guidance, you know, uh, in, in the spring, do this, in the fall, do that. And our intent is in this big discovery phase, let's find out what nested. Phase two is, you know, five years from now, let's go analyze them with the, you know, universities out there and see how do we work with the bees from the bees perspective. Phase three, let's go raise a bunch of them. Phase four, and I'm maybe saying 20 years from now, 15 years from now, let's go put these bees back where they belong, wild space, farm, and yard. So that's, it takes a lot of energy right there, trying to just muscle through this. And it's just getting headway. We're, we're you know, we feel comfortable that it's going. And then the last little piece um, we're asking, we're working with researchers. I'm tomorrow actually meeting with Washington State University personnel. What research could be done that would benefit the farmer, the grower? And so I'm, I'm a more of a, I'm a ecologist, so I'm probably focusing more on the organic farms. But yeah, kind of fun, those things. And that's, um, yeah. And then probably wrapping ourselves, all of that, gosh, Nicole, my company teaches. We have everything we know of out there for free. You know, we have a thing called B-Mail. Once a month, do this. Our website shows you what to do, how to do, why to do, what the pests are. Real intuitively laid out. You know, we, we're trying to work, you know, all these, we're just trying to teach so that we get more bees out of it. So that's my company. Well, I think that's really a really wonderful philosophy. Yeah. And every now and then a perk, I get to be on some really cool podcasts, you know? <laughs> those are the best perks. <laughs> those, are the, those are the perks. More people listening to what, what word nutty people are thinking about. Of course. Yeah. So if I could summarize kind of my position, I would hope that your listeners realize there's a lot of species of bees out there. One cool one makes honey. And then there are gentle bees that nest in holes. They're easy to raise. With, you know, my company teaches you what to do. And then the third little piece, and I'm asking you to, you know, whoever you are, listen carefully. Go look up the Native Bee Network. It's a big deal. And it should be bigger than the U.S. It should be a worldwide piece. The food-making bees are being ignored for the honeybee, okay, in loving words. And at, at an expense of food. And um, just go look at that and pass that knowledge, whatever you learned there, to your friends. That's it. I mean, so there's your summary. Fair enough? Fair enough. So if somebody, after listening to this episode, was inspired to start a native bee colony of their own, how can they get access to your products and your information and your guidance? Uh, go on the internet. <laughs> uh, Crown, C-R-O-W-N, bees b-e-e-s dot com so while you're there you'll find under the menu tab you're going to see there's a shop so we have products and we teach you there's stuff for beginning and here's you know the more experience so that's all in the shop section as you float around you'll see there's a learn section and we teach you the ins and outs of the mason bees and the leaf cutter bees and the wild bees and you know there's that you'll see programs yeah we work with community gardens we work with the native bee network you know, bee buyback. We have the bees from Pennsylvania back here this month. You know, here um, we're talking in October. And then, you know, while you're there, at the very bottom of every page, there's a little thing that says sign up for bee mail. Just do that. That, you know, it's just my team once a month saying, hey, do this. So 
I guess that's, that would be it. Uh, we've got books. There's a book out there, The Mace Me Revolution. I wrote that. That's kind of on our website. But in general, I think you'll find it, you know, and, and we're in more nurseries. At some point, we might be in Costco and Home Depot, and that's a few years from now. But yeah, you'll find us on the website. Wonderful. Yeah, I know I subscribe to your newsletter, and that's really helped me support my native bee house because sometimes there are things you need to do, and time gets away from you, and the next thing you know, you get an email, and you're, oh, yeah, I need to go do this. <laughs> okay, and it's not that bad, is it? No, it's really not. It's not. Okay, and, and we do say, like, we've got this stuff for sale, but, you know, and we are a for-profit company, but we sure. try to teach. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they've been okay. definitely very helpful. That's okay, that's good feedback. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Dave, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your wonderful knowledge of natives. And I, I hope that this has inspired others to consider them and maybe given listeners a little bit more confidence and um, interest in putting a native house in their yard. That's awesome. Yes. I, I, and I appreciate it. And this was, um, as I floated through your, your website, you have so much good knowledge there, Nicole. Oh, thank you. So whoever else is listening, go <laughs> She has a lot of really neat stuff there. Just don't listen. Go read. There's good stuff. <laughs> Thanks. So always back at building. you. Thanks, thanks for doing what you're doing, Nicole. This is always um, so important to teach people that are busy. And if they can go someplace and learn something easy and apply that one or two things, ah, that's all we could ask. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Marshall, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Dave. Bye. Bye-bye. And for those of you at home, thank you so much for listening to Backyard Bounty. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty a podcast by heritageacresmarket.com. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, please email us at ask at heritageacresmarket.com. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.